it and they can see the I'll make sure I have the dot cam. Can you do the dot cam? Will that work? Hmm. Okay. Well, the dot cam does not seem to want to. Um, there we go. I have something to show you on the dot cam. That's why I'm seeing if I can get it to work. But it's not. Oh. Okay. Let's just go ahead and do that. All right. <clears throat> I probably screwed that screen up permanently. Who knows? Input D. There we go. Excellent. I'll throw that rock up there. It's important for later. I don't want to forget that rock. It's important. Okay, so week two. We're going to start chapter two. Does anybody have any questions about the material or what we're doing? We're all good? Excellent. Okay, so the first homework assignment will be posted later today. You'll see it in Learn. I don't have anything on mastering biology through Pearson. All your assignments, it'll be uh, multiple choice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'll just have some multiple choice questions in Learn, and it will be under the folder week two. So you'll just see an assignment. It'll, be, it'll look like a quiz or something, but it will be your homework assignment. Are we good? Yeah, and I'll send out a, a, an email when that becomes available. Okay, so today let's talk about water and carbon the chemical basis of life and um this is the start of chapter two and just to give you a heads up some of the stuff i'm going to talk about this morning is not in the book but i think it's really cool i like to put everything in a larger context and one other thing that i, I want to talk about is in this chapter we kind of start building the story of abiogenesis chemical evolution this is how we go from, you know, simple geological processes, chemical reactions, and we go through chemical evolution. We develop or evolve more and more complex chemicals, more complex chemical reactions, which leads to abiogenesis. You guys remember what abiogenesis is? A means without, bio means life, genesis means origin. So we lead up from chemical evolution to abiogenesis, which is the origins of life from things that are non-living. And that's going to be a running theme. And if you remember last week, we talked about what is life, or what I like to say, what does life do? And we talked about life as being an action, a verb. And that's an underlying theme that I'm going to keep coming back to, because that will make more sense for understanding how life got started. Are we good? Okay. So today, what we're going to do is I'm going to explain our connections to the universe. I know, what in the world are we talking about? Astronomy and cosmology and Big Bang and all of that in a biology class. Well, you know, I always like to start from the beginning, and I think this is just absolutely fascinating to think about some of these questions about how life is connected to the universe. After that, we're going to talk about the atomic structure, like how atoms are put together and how that leads to the different elements and how elements combine to form compounds and molecules. So we'll go over that. And then if I have time, we will start with the importance of water for life today. Good? Okay. So here it is, learning objective. What's our connection to the universe? And I, didn't I say that biology is like the apex science, that we're on top of everything? Chemistry, physics, geology, climatology, astronomy. Biology is the apex of all of that. And uh, the reason why is we're, we're, we're deeply connected to the universe. Oh, and as a side note, I just found out that like last week, my parents were on YouTube watching me lecture. So hi, mom and dad. <laughs> Okay, brief history of time. 
Hmm, sounds like a book from Stephen Hawking, doesn't it? So let me ask you a question. How old is the universe? Anybody have any idea of how old the universe might be? Yeah. Yeah, you're almost spot on. Good job. It's about 13.7 billion years old. Now, I like to ask that question because the, the universe is 13.7 billion years old. That means several things. That means it started sometime in the past. It hasn't always been here. It's got an age. And, of course, um, it started with what is called the Big Bang. And the Big Bang Theory explains the origins of the universe as best we know. It's also a pretty cool TV show I keep watching. I'm, I'm currently binging Big Bang Theory now. I'm in season seven. It's good. But the Big Bang was the origins of our universe 13.7 billion years ago. Here's one of our first connections to the universe. During the Big Bang, we had all of the subatomic particles, all the matter in the universe was created. So protons, neutrons, and electrons, they were all created during the Big Bang. Same with all the energy. So if you guys remember, protons, neutrons, and electrons, these are subatomic particles. And what do they make up? Atoms, exactly. So you're made up of atoms that are made up of these tiny subatomic particles. They are 13.7 billion years old. That means that the building blocks that make you up, we're all made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons, are all 13.7 billion years old. Wow. So they've been inside of stars. They've been in space. They were created in this cataclysmic explosion called the Big Bang, and they're ancient, very long lived. Oh, wrong one there. And just for anybody that's wondering how we know the age of the universe, well, we have these large telescopes, one of them being the Hubble Space Telescope. And the Hubble Space Telescope can see pretty far back in the universe's past because the further away an object is, the longer the light has taken to travel there, right? So if we see an object that's about 13 billion light years away, that means that light has been traveling for 13 billion years. And we typically, we don't see anything past about 13.1 billion light years because that's when the first stars began to form and light up the universe. So during the Big Bang, we had protons, neutrons, and electrons were all formed. And they went on to go form huh, the first elements, hydrogen, helium. Hydrogen is, of course, element number one, one proton, one electron. Helium is, you know, a couple protons, a couple neutrons, a couple electrons, right? Two, two, and two. And 75% of the universe is hydrogen and helium. And these clouds of hydrogen and helium formed and began to form the first stars. And stars, you know, lit up the night sky or lit up the universe. And the stars actually formed clusters called galaxies. And uh, you can see in this Hubble ultra deep field view, you know, thousands of galaxies in, the, in, the, in this one field of view that if you hold your finger out at arm's length, it'd be about one tenth the width of your fingernail. We saw like 10,000 galaxies in there. Isn't that amazing? There's like between 500 billion and a trillion galaxies in the universe. And of course, our solar system, the sun, and then the, nine, and the planets, nine planets, eight planets. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to believe anymore. They're talking about adding Pluto back as a planet. Poor little Pluto. It's smaller than our own moon, right? So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what they do with that. But this is our galaxy. This is what our galaxy looks like. You are here, about 30 or so thousand light years from the center. So the center of our galaxy is, of course, this really large black hole. It's enormous. 
So we're about 30,000 light years from it. Our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across, and it has estimates range from a billion stars to a trillion stars. And it's probably closer to a trillion stars in our galaxy alone. That's a lot, isn't it? And of course, for any Star Trek fan out there, that's what the galaxy looks like with the Federation, the Borg space, the Romulan Star Empire, and the Klingon Empire, just if anybody's interested. And if you've ever been out in a star in a dark sky, you can see the Milky Way. You can see one of the armbands of the Milky Way. And that's, of course, lit up by stars and dust and nebula where stars are formed. Now, you might be wondering why I'm talking about stars so much. Stars are very important for us. If the Big Bang created protons, neutrons, and electrons that formed hydrogen and helium, well, what are you mostly made of? What kind of elements? Carbon, oxygen. I mean, by weight, we're mostly oxygen, right? Like 60-something percent, carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen. I mean, that's 96% that's of what we are. But didn't I just say the Big Bang created hydrogen and helium? Are we missing some stuff? Some ingredients of life? Nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, sodium, potassium, chlorine, iron, calcium, sulfur. We're missing all of these, aren't we? Well, this is where stars come in for several reasons. Stars release energy. They're so big that at the center of them, as they collapse, they heat up. But what happens to a gas when it, when it gets more and more compressed? It heats up, right? It gains more and more kinetic energy. And what happens is at the center of stars, hydrogen begins to fuse and releases energy. It's an exothermic reaction. <coughs> and then as it releases energy, life uses that energy, doesn't it? Life needs an input of energy. So life uses energy. But as it fuses, it takes this hydrogen and begins to release, sorry, begins to form helium. So we start building up larger and larger molecules, and we're releasing energy that life needs. That's another way we're connected to the universe. And of course, I always like to talk about stars. They're, uh, they're quite abundant in the universe. There are more stars in the universe than there are sand grains on all the beaches of the world. So there's a lot of stars. There's a lot of solar systems, right? There's a lot of energy being pumped out onto the planets. Um, is there a lot of potential for biology in the universe? I would think so. And not in stars, you know, they come in various shapes and or various sizes. Our star is actually above average, believe it or not. Our sun is actually slightly above average because we think that most suns are these red dwarfs right here, that they're small. And red dwarfs can last a very long time. Uh, our star will burn through its hydrogen in the next few billions of years, and then bad things will happen to us, and I don't want to go there. But do you notice if this is the size of our star, there's some bigger ones, aren't there? For those of you at home, there's some much bigger stars out there. This is where it becomes incredibly important for life. Big stars. Not just the sun-like stars that are creating energy for us, but these large stars like Canis Majoris. This is our sun. This is the orbit of the Earth. If you were in a Boeing 737 or whatever jet, it would take you like a thousand years to fly around that star. <clears throat> a thousand years. Isn't that crazy? So these things are fusing and they're big and they're hot. And they're creating these elements like helium. But these larger stars, they'll rip through their hydrogen so fast. And then they collapse and they have helium. And if you collapse them more, it heats up. What do you think continues to happen? more nuclear fusion, right? Now we start to fuse lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. 
when we start forming these heavier elements inside of stars. So what I'm telling you is that the carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen, the calcium, the potassium, the sodium, the sulfur that we need to live, right? Those heavier elements were formed inside of stars much larger than our own, than our star, right? They were formed inside those stars. Now the question is, well, these elements are in us, right? They're not inside of some dead star somewhere. Well, these larger stars, at the end of their life, they will quickly tear through their hydrogen, and then they'll collapse, and they'll start creating these you know, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. And then so they go through this series of, of, of collapses. They keep making more and more right up until the time they make the element iron. You see, whenever you fuse any element lighter than iron, which is I think uh, somebody could correct me on this. I think it's element number 26 or something. I can't believe I forgot the number. It doesn't matter. When you start fusing iron, you go from an exothermic reaction. So a star won't collapse further if it's doing fusion. But when you start fusing iron, it takes more energy to fuse it than energy is released. So, so it goes from exothermic to endothermic, it's not giving off any more energy. And, well, we're not entirely sure exactly what happens, but we believe that the inner core of the star collapses and then rebounds and forms what is called a supernova explosion. And there are different types of supernova explosions. But these explosions create additional heavier elements. Anybody in here wearing gold? Anybody wearing gold? Silver? Platinum? You ever heard of mercury, lead, uranium? Yeah. All of the elements heavier than iron and nickel were created when a star blew up. So if you're wearing gold, you're wearing the remnants of a supernova explosion. That's awesome, isn't it? I mean, that stuff was formed when a star went boom. And then because it explodes, it takes all of those heavier elements that were formed and releases them into the galaxy. And of course, those heavier elements go on to form second, third, fourth generation systems like ours, right? So we're on a rocky planet, the earth, we're iron, nickel, a lot of silicates. So silica and oxygen, carbon is in our core. We're, we're very abundant with these elements, oxygen, so all the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the other heavier elements on our planet were formed inside of stars that lived and died billions of years ago, at least 5 billion years ago. Your stardust. And of course, it led to heavy metal as well. You know, like uh, Iron Maiden, Metallica, and if you're going to mention heavy metal, Black Sabbath, who basically invented metal. And if you notice, I know you guys are young and this was long before your time, but that is Metallica from Master of Puppets with Cliff Burton, the bassist. Just saying. Trujillo is really good. He was actually in another band from the 80s called Suicidal Tendencies, if anybody's interested. There's a great song called uh, Institutionalized that I feel like sometimes right now. <laughs> And then, oh, yeah, Ice-T has a new version of it from Body Count. Okay, so here it is, uh, the periodic table of elements. The top two, hydrogen and helium, created in the Big Bang, or shortly thereafter, a few hundred thousand years later, right? It had to cool off. But all these other elements were created when uh, inside of stars. I was right. Iron is number 26. So uh, anything lighter than iron was formed through nuclear fusion inside of a star. And then everything heavier than iron, which is, you know, there's what, 92 naturally occurring minus 26. I'm going to do the math really quick. All those other elements were, of course, created when stars went boom. So that is our connection to the universe, right? I mean, we are literally stardust. It's kind of, I just love thinking about the fact that the, <clears throat> excuse me, that the carbon in your body that life is centered around, the organic molecules, was created 
inside of a star that exploded. And that carbon has been around for over 5 billion years. I mean, you have carbon atoms in you that were in fossil fuels, gasoline that was burned in a car, carbon dioxide that was floating around in the atmosphere, carbon that was in a dinosaur. Yeah, you have carbon atoms in you that were in dinosaurs and rocks. Pretty crazy. Okay. So there's a, an artistic rendition of a supernova. And of course, all those elements, they form nebula. This is Orion Nebula. This is where stars are born. And of course, the Earth was formed about 4.6 billion years ago. So we're like a second, third, maybe even a fourth generation system because we have all these heavy elements that were created by stellar processes. Good? All right. Okay, so yeah, I'm just gonna skip this here. We don't need to. So you guys kind of have this, right? The, the importance of stellar processes for life. You know, not only did it create the, the elements we need for living systems, but where do we get all of our energy from? Or at least most of us. The sun, right? There are, there are animals. I mean, sorry. Yeah. There's life on this earth that exists completely without the need for sunlight at all. They live off of thermal vents, which is kind of cool. They live off of energy from the radioactivity of our own, um, our own planet, which provides them with heat and nutrients. Pretty wild. Okay. So that material that I just went over is not in the book, but you will be responsible for it. Good? Okay. Now we're going to follow the book fairly closely. From here on out, just remember the one thing that I'm going to give a larger context to is thinking about the life is an action. Life does something, right? Life is a system out of equilibrium. I don't like to use the five characteristics that the book gives, and that will become apparent as we start talking about, you know, the origins of life through chemical evolution. Good? Okay. All right. Uh the reason why I'm showing this photo right here of a deep sea alkaline vent is that that might have been an area that led to biogenesis. That's where life may have formed in something like that. And oh man, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So I was talking about the age of the earth. One thing that I have that's actually kind of kind of cool here. is this if you look it's kind of hard to see it in this it's not really doing a good job at any rate this is a a uh, meteor this is an iron meteor it's really heavy and this of course was uh formed when a star exploded you know so it's at least five billion years old and it probably hit the earth in the last few hundred years 50 years uh it would, it would be buried most likely and what's cool is that this meteor was formed when a star exploded and floated around in space for over 5 billion years. This thing is older than the Earth. And for anybody at home, uh, my dad acquired this for me, this meteor. I like to bring it to every class I teach because I, I love always somehow working in life's connection to, um, to the universe. Okay. So, of course, this is our periodic table of elements. Um, these are the elements commonly used by a life. And if you notice that there are um, different elements, and so they have different atomic structure, but there's a general overlying atomic structure. You guys have all had chemistry, right? How would you rate your knowledge on atomic structure and covalent bonding and ionic bonding and hydrogen bonding? How many of you want a little refresher? Just a little one? Okay. All right. So I will turn this here to the board so everybody can see. But basically, you've got these subatomic particles. Protons have a positive charge. 
neutrons, well, neutron, neutral, name gives it away. And then electrons, which I always think of as elect, like uh, energy, electrons, electricity. And of course, these things have a negative charge. Now, the most simplistic way we, we view atoms or elements um, is like this kind of like orbital thing here, kind of like a Lewis dot structure. You guys know that that's not entirely true, right? That it's way more, way more complex than that. That basically we do have protons and neutrons and they're found where? In the nucleus. And then the electrons, so if I've got a nucleus here, and then orbiting, or they're not really orbiting the nucleus, are they? But they're found in what's called electron shells. And these electron shells represent uh, discrete energy levels, discrete positions of where these electrons are found. And I'm not going to get into it here. But you also know that electron shells are further subdivided into orbitals, right? And, you know, you've got your S and P orbitals, and there are these dumbbell-shaped things like this. And this is the probability of where you would find an electron something like 90% of the time in these orbitals. Good? And if anybody likes astronomy and you study stars, uh, the way that wave light goes through atoms and goes through these orbitals affects a spectrum. And that's how we can like determine that helium is in the sun or we can find water um, in the universe or we can look at a star and tell you what elements are in it by the way that the light passes through atoms and affects with these orbitals. Good. And these orbitals, of course, they hold up the two electrons each. We good with that? That's why we see the electrons as being paired. Okay. Some things that I like to think about with it with atoms, they're mostly empty space. That's why I have this thing that says of flea, ping pong balls, fleas, and football stadiums. Of course, this is Dote Campbell Stadium, home to the greatest football team of all time, the Florida State Seminoles. Just kidding. We forgot how to play football, I think, recently. But I was there in the 90s when they built the whole stadium there. And the reason why I'm showing that is because if you took an atom and the protons and neutrons were ping pong balls, they would be about center field. So right there would be the nucleus. The electrons would be like fleas outside the stadium in the orbitals. Atoms are mostly empty space. Good? Yeah, it's pretty wild, isn't it? it? It's actually, there's one thing wrong with that analogy, and that is that the electrons, I don't know that they're actually a thousand times smaller than a proton. They just weigh, their mass is a thousand times less than a proton. So when we start talking about atomic mass, we don't count the electrons because their mass is 1,000th that of an electron, I mean 1,000th that of a proton or a neutron. Good? I just don't know their exact size. I don't think anybody really does. Well, they do, but not too accurately. Okay. And of course, we're talking about elements. You know, remember that the four most abundant elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. Okay. Let's see if I have a... There's another word you need to know, or another term, the atomic number. This is very simple. It's equal to the number of protons. So if you're hydrogen, you have one proton. If you're carbon, you have six. If you're nitrogen, you have seven. If you're oxygen, you have eight. The point here 
is that if you change the number of protons in the nucleus, you change the element. And you can only do that by a nuclear process, a nuclear reaction, fusion or fission. There is no chemical reaction that can change an element. Are we good? Okay, straightforward stuff. Uh, <clears throat> And then atomic mass, of course, is neutrons plus, sorry, protons plus the neutrons. And the reason why that's the mass is because neutrons have a very similar mass to protons. They're slightly heavier, but not by much. About an electron's worth. All right, everybody good with this? Okay, so this... You have protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and this is important because that helps stabilize your nucleus. You have to have a favorable ratio of neutrons to protons. And as your element gets larger and larger and larger, you start packing more and more neutrons in there to stabilize the, the, the nucleus. Also, in any element, protons equal the number of electrons. And that is important. In any element, like if you have carbon, you have six protons. How many electrons? Six. And those number of electrons really start to affect the chemical properties of an element. Okay? So that's why each element, there's 92 of them that... There's more, there's some transuranium ones and technetium doesn't really exist on the earth. You know, so, you know, 91 naturally occurring. The other ones are, they, they don't last long enough to be around for very long. But they all have these number of electrons in their shells and orbitals, which affects their chemical properties. Are we good? Okay, now really quickly, uh, <clears throat> You change the protons, you change the element. Can you change the number of neutrons? Yeah, absolutely. So you guys know about carbon 13, uh, or let's say, let's just start with carbon 12, that's the most abundant, and carbon 14. So you know that an isotope varies in the number of neutrons. It's pretty straightforward, right? <clears throat> you guys have all had your chemistry. So if carbon is element number six, how many, how many neutrons here? Six, Seven. yep, and eight. So we keep increasing the number of neutrons. These two are stable. And what about carbon-14? What do we know about that? It's a radioisotope. It's emitting particles. Absolutely. Do you remember which kind of particle? Um, no. That's a tough question. But you're absolutely right about it, emitting particles. <clears throat> Carbon-14. Oh, sorry. What it does is it emits an electron. So basically, a neutron kicks out an electron. I don't know how this happens because I don't study quantum physics. I've asked. But basically, you have an up, up, down quark making a proton. One switches to a down quark, so you have up, down, down, and you, you have a proton, and you have an electron. I, I don't know how this works. But I do know that carbon-14 kicks out an electron, and it becomes nitrogen. It decays into nitrogen because a neutron becomes a proton, Right? You go from element six to seven, but you still maintain your same atomic mass because now I have, instead of having um, eight neutrons, I now have seven neutrons. And instead of six protons, I now have seven protons. And that is one type of radioactive decay. The other type of radioactive decay occurs in heavier elements like uranium. And uranium kicks out a helium nuclei two protons, two neutrons, and it will decay all the way eventually through a complicated series all the way down to lead. Good? Okay, that's 
right to decay and isotopes. And as you know, we have uh, a, a baseball team here. Are they still the isotopes? Yeah. Uh, you know, the Simpsons had the isotopes back in like 92. I think it was in college then. I just want to bring up really quickly that we use isotopes for many types of study in science. I mean, they're vitally important. Uh, most of us are familiar with radioisotopes. And let me be clear because I'm going to ask a question on this. If I ask you how we would date a rock that's billions of years old, don't tell me carbon-14. You will get it wrong. We use radioisotopes, and we might use isotopes of uranium or strontium or something else or potassium. Carbon-14 only really goes back about 50,000 years because it has a half-life of about 5,700 years. Okay. But we can use them for all kinds of things, ecology, climate change, geology. You know, we date rocks using radioisotopes. And notice, I keep saying radioisotopes, not carbon-14. We do use carbon-14, but for things that died within the last 50, maybe 100,000 years. Are we good? All right. Well, let's just get that. And of course, you guys know about half-life. You guys know about half-life, right? Yeah, okay, good. We also use isotopes in ecology, climate change, uh, this is an actually an older slide, but stable isotopes, uh, you, you, you have ratios of these isotopes. And so, for example, you have both carbon-13 and carbon-12. This one is rare. And what you might find is that you'll have a sample that has a specific ratio of light to heavy isotopes. And if that ratio changes against your standard, there's something causing that. So for example, we can look at the ratios of carbon-13 to carbon-12. And if we're getting more carbon-13 than we think we should have, we're becoming enriched, then we can identify a specific type of process that's occurring. Or it might become depleted. And we can use that to like trace where carbon is coming from in, a, in an ecosystem. Like if you're in a river, are you getting your carbon from terrestrial sources, from algae production? If you're living next to a river, are you relying on you know, carbon growing from trees? Or how about carbon from algae? And we can actually tell the difference of where that carbon is coming from based on, uh, on isotopes. Nitrogen also has isotopes. There's nitrogen 14, nitrogen 15. And we can track how high up you are in the food web we have to leave you become more and more depleted as you go higher and up in the food web. So this shows different species based on their carbon to nitrogen fractionations, which is those different ratios. And you can see that the species are occupying different spaces. Good. Any questions here? We can also use oxygen like O18 to study climate change because whether or not you're hot or cold, will change the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16. So we can use that to also reconstruct climate regions. So when they when they uh, drill down and grab those ice cores from the Arctic or the Antarctic, those ice cores have tiny air bubbles. And those tiny air bubbles have the atmosphere from 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, 600,000 years ago. And we can look at the ratios of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 and reconstruct the climate. Okay? We can also do that with sea creatures. We can look at the oxygen ratios in them as well. So stable isotopes, like I said, are incredibly important for many different studies. We can even trace the origins of pollution using uh, isotopes. Okay, so you guys are familiar with everything about atomic structure and isotopes. Good? All right. And bonding. How many of you are a little itchy on, or sketchy on the bonding? Everybody know this pretty well? Re refresh it really quick. OK. OK, 
okay, your elements come together to form compounds and molecules. Basically, a compound is something like salt. I can have a gram of salt or I could have a ton of salt. I will always have a ratio of one to one, sodium to chlorine, right? So a compound is always in a fixed ratio. Molecules may or may not be, but molecules are held are different elements held together by chemical bonding. And for our purposes, we're going to talk about two types of bonds that form compounds and molecules, and a third bond called a hydrogen bond, which is really important for the properties of water and also for a lot of biological processes. Okay. All right. So um, I've got, a, I added in a bunch of slides, really giving a detailed account of covalent bonding. I'm not going to go through those slides right now. I'm just going to draw it on the board for you. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. We have to be careful. We can have death by PowerPoint pretty quickly, can't we? I know. Luckily, you know, in all these rooms, I love how they put the big projector like right in the middle of the chalkboard. I guess I could bring it up and use that one, but oh well. Okay, let's look at hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen and talk about bonding using these elements because, I mean, these are really, really common. And of course, they're really important for life. So the first one we're going to talk about is covalent bonds. And there's some words here that we can break, or there's some roots that we can break down. Co means with, valent, those means a specific set of electrons. Those are the electrons in your outermost shell. And those electrons are usually most involved with bonding that we're concerned about for organic chemistry. There, there, there's always exceptions, right? But we're just going to go very basic here. So let's start with a hydrogen atom. It's got one proton, and one electron in its innermost shell. And for those of you that have had chemistry, how many electrons does that outermost shell need or want to have to be chemically stable? Two. Right, because this shell is also its orbital, and we know the orbitals are chemically stable when they have two electrons. And what I mean by chemical or chemistry, we're talking about making and breaking bonds. Okay, so I've got I've got hydrogen over here with this one lone electron that is not chemically stable. It wants two. So if I've got another hydrogen over here. So this one electron, they will share those electrons, and I have now formed a chemical bond called a covalent bond. And there's your covalent bond right here. And we would look at it, and we see hydrogen, hydrogen, and there that line represents your covalent bond. Any questions? Okay. Let's look at carbon. What's the element number for, or the atomic number of carbon? Six. How many protons? How many electrons? Right, six and six. So we've got our inner shell. We're going to fill that up first with two electrons. And then we have our, our second shell. One, two, three, four. They fill up each orbital one at a time. That means I've got these orbitals. I've got four unpaired electrons. Well, what does this mean for carbon? It can form how many covalent bonds? Four, right? Up to four. It will forms four. It does that to be chemically stable. So if I've got hydrogen, there's one. There's two, there's three, and then we have one more hydrogen out here, and we could draw this. What is this molecule? Anybody know? Methane, exactly. <clears throat>
And then this chemical formula, of course, a CH4. I've got one carbon, four hydrogens, and it's held together by a chemical bond called your covalent bond. And it's called a covalent bond because it's sharing these outermost electrons, which are your valence electrons and your valence shell. Hence the name covalent bond. Straightforward? Okay. Now, let's say I've got carbon like this, and I attach a hydroxyl, a hydroxyl group. Now, if you don't know what a hydroxyl group is, I'll come back to this. But this is one of our functional groups. So I added an OH here. Now, this molecule is really different. Methanol is very different from methane. Okay? One's a gas. What is the other one? It's a liquid, right? This is an alcohol. This is a hydrocarbon. This is gas. This is liquid. Unless you put it under pressure or make it really cold. But for room temperature, which is what we exist at, this, of course, is a gas. This is a liquid. Now, this is where we start learning a little bit more about our covalent bonds. Covalent bonds can either be, there's two flavors, right? There's two types. And it's, it's a spectrum. It's not either or. It's on a curve. But do you remember what we can ever, covalent bonds can be? Either this would be one type and this would be the other type. I'm hearing it. Yep. Non-polar and polar. So we can have covalent bonds that are either Polar covalent bonds or non -co or non-polar covalent bonds. And whether or not we have one of these two depends on another property of our elements called electronegativity. I'm a little out of practice writing on the board. Sorry, guys. It's been a couple years. Okay. So let's talk about this for a second. Let's begin with this term right here, electronegativity. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, that is well said. Well said. Is how much another element or atom wants an electron. Okay. So electronegativity is a measure of how, how well an element attracts an electron, okay? And if we, I'm gonna come back to this. Well, let's look at our elements of life. This is electronegativity and it's increasing. So we go from here to here, okay? So an electron has what charge? A negative. A proton has what kind of charge? Negative and positive. Opposites attract, right? So nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon. That makes sense. It's got one more proton. Oxygen, being element number eight, has one more proton than nitrogen, two more than carbon. So therefore, oxygen is more electronegative than either one of these. In fact, Oxygen is the second most electronegative element in the universe. Fluorine being number one. But oxygen loves electrons. I know hydrogen only has one, and carbon has six protons, but they're of similar electronegativities. Anybody know why? Oh, huh, never thought of it that way. Carbon's trying to get to whichever is closest. Yeah, this one, well, the reason why they're, well, you're talking about filling the electron shells to make them stable, but the reason why they have a similar attraction toward the electrons 
is a distance. Hydrogen has one electron shell. This is in the second electron shell, so they're much further away from the nucleus. So the nucleus exerts a similar attraction to its proton than one proton does in hydrogen. So good? Okay. All right. So this is important to see. So if I have a, co a covalent bond of nitrogen and oxygen, these would all be polar covalent bonds because the nitrogen would attract electrons from carbon, but then oxygen would pull electrons away from nitrogen. Okay? And that would form a polar covalent bond. But if I go carbon and hydrogen, that would be a nonpolar covalent bond because they're sharing electrons equally. Okay? So anytime you have two elements combined together sharing electrons, if one element is more electronegative than another element, you have a polar covalent bond. Good with that? This is important. It's actually very important. Because if I have a hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon, the, the name gives it away, right? Hydro, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, and carbon. These are all nonpolar covalent bonds. The reason why this is a gas at room temperature is because it has no real way of interacting with other elements or other molecules easily. Okay? Now, I add on a hydroxyl group, which is one of our functional groups. Now, all of a sudden, I have a polar covalent bond. So in this case, oxygen being more electronegative than carbon, more electronegative than hydrogen, will attract the electrons and become... This is a delta symbol. It means partially charged negative. Because I'm pulling the electron away from this proton out here, this becomes partially positive. I now have positive and negative regions of my molecule because I've got a polar molecule. And what this can now do is form a hydrogen bond, okay? And a hydrogen bond is a weak electrostatic attraction between molecules that have polar regions on them, okay? Opposites attract. So oxygen here is attracting the protons off the hydrogens in water, Water is a polar molecule. It has a partially charged oxygen end, and it has a partially positive end over here, these hydrogens, and these things will attract each other, and that forms a hydrogen bond. That is why methane is a gas, is because it can't form hydrogen bonds. Methanol is a liquid, because it will form hydrogen bonds with other molecules of methanol and with water. So that's a reason why alcohol, which is ethanol, which is just a second carbon here, can dissolve in water. Okay? So something's capable of forming hydrogen bonds. We'll learn these terms. It's hydrophilic. Hydro. Of course, means water. And then philic, file means loving. So it's water loving. And then if you're a hydrocarbon, you are hydrophobic. Hydro once again means water. Anybody have a fear of the dark? It's a great Iron Maiden song. Yeah, I do. I admit it. I have a fear of the dark. I. Whoa, come back here. Don't kick me out. Okay, sure. Phobia means you have a fear of something. So if you're hydrophobic, you don't dissolve in water. And part of the reason why you don't dissolve in water is because you can't form hydrogen bonds with water. Okay? All right. Anybody ever watch Beavis and Butthead? Classic stuff. Yeah, I used to stop studying in, in college to watch the latest episodes. 
Okay. Let's talk really quick about ionic bonds. Because in a way, they're sort of related to hydrogen bonds, except that they're very, very, very strong. And if you ask a chemist, ionic bonds are the strongest bonds. They're even stronger than some covalent bonds. It's just that the water, you know, the, the, the chemistry of life takes place in water. And, well, you know, ionic bonds come apart in water, whereas co many covalent bonds do not. Okay, let's look at how an ionic bond works. Here's sodium. There's this inner shell. It's got 11. So this is, we'll fill up this shell right here, and then we'll go, that's 10 electrons. So we've got one more electron out here, one lone electron out here. And it's out in this third shell. And then chlorine. Chlorine, anybody know the, the atomic number of chlorine? Yeah, 17, right? So then here's the second shell. It's all filled up. And then here's the third shell. And it's got seven electrons in its third shell. Now, something we've talked about, this shell needs two. These other two shells need how many electrons to be chemically stable? Eight. Okay, so I've got one here. So this one would need like seven protons. I mean, sorry, seven electrons. How many would this one need? One, right? Okay, which one of these elements is more electronegative? Chlorine. And the reason why chlorine is more electronegative than sodium is because it's got six more protons, six more positive charges, right? So what happens is that electron comes over here. This shell now has eight, but now I've got 17 protons, 18 electrons. This becomes an anion, negatively charged. Sodium loses an electron. How many electrons does it have? Two plus eight, 10. And this becomes a cation, because I have 11 protons, 10 electrons, positively charged. And what do opposite charges do? They attract. There you go, that's an ionic bond. It's a strong electro electrostatic attraction between two charged particles. A cation, which is positively charged, and an anion, which is negatively charged. Okay, any questions? That's bonding. Are we good? Okay. And then, of course, we're going to talk more about chemical reactions, but not today. Chemical reactions are making and breaking bonds. So like a fire is a chemical reaction that's releasing energy. You're breaking apart, you know, the glucose molecules and the carbon dioxide and water. You're not changing the elements, but you're rearranging them into new molecules. And one thing about chemical reactions, they require an input of energy to break the bonds. And when the new bonds form, energy is released. Okay. Well, this chapter, we're going to switch gears here. We're going to talk about water. We're all done with bonding, right? I know chemistry is everybody's favorite, isn't it? <laughs> I see some eyes rolling and some, uh, I hate the chemistry. You know, I, and for whatever weird reason, I always liked chemistry. And I, I'm alone in that, I think, in many cases. There are people that like it, but I know it's not everybody's uh, favorite topic. But, you know, chemistry is really cool because, I mean, that's like the basis of biology is we start with a bunch of chemical reactions. Yeah. Did you like your chem instructors? I did. Oh. And one of my favorite teachers in all of college was my first year undergraduate uh, by a chemistry teacher. And because I was told in high school that, like, your professors don't care about you. You're just another number. And, of course, being an incoming freshman, I screwed up my schedule. He took down my student ID and fixed it for me. And he was an amazing lecturer and like really kind and caring. So, yeah. Must be nice. 
and then my OCHEM teacher was actually pretty good too. Yeah, I, I, I was very fortunate, very fortunate. Okay, ironically, I had biology teachers that I was like, what? <laughs> yep, I know. Okay, let's talk about water. Water is a, so an interesting substance here. And we're gonna talk about the importance of water for life, some of the early oceans and how these things led to abiogenesis. But what I'm gonna really focus on is the properties of water that make it important for life. And the base of this is hydrogen bonding. Water is a polar molecule, and that is very important. Oh boy, are we daydreaming a little bit? Of course, I'll, I'll put this back on here. My beautiful view of the Florida Keys, nice clear blue water. You guys wanna be here, right? course yeah that's water hey did you know if it weren't for oxygen the oceans would not look like that they would look kind of like an olive dirty martini color because of all the iron but oxygen cleared out the oceans of iron and they look that color now okay why is water important for life I mean, we have to drink water. We could probably quote that we're 75% we're water, give or take how dehydrated you are, how much muscle tissue versus fat tissue. But we're mostly bags of water. Life, even down at the cellular level, is mostly bags of water. So life requires water, and life began in water. Life began about 38 to probably earlier than 4 billion years ago in the ancient oceans. And this is, of course, the lost city of Atlantis. It's a thermal vent. It's called an alkaline thermal vent because it's, it's got a higher pH than the surrounding ocean. And these thermal vents live you know, for thousands of years. And we think that life emerged from chemical processes, geological processes, and thermal vents that looked like that billions of years ago. Like I said, that's, and that's different from the really like the, the black smokers, the ones that are really hot, that spew out all that black stuff. That's all the iron and pyruvate and stuff like that. Iron pyruvate, I'm sorry, blowing out of the, of the earth at like 400 degrees. Those are between 80 and about 120 degrees. Lots of them around 100 degrees. 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't think Celsius very well. I'm sorry. I'm a bad scientist. I grew up here. I, I think in Fahrenheit and miles. I'm so sad, so dumb, the worst stupid system in the world. But 100 degrees Fahrenheit, what's about your body temperature? Pretty close to that, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, probably not much of a coincidence there. Okay, so yeah, um, we need water. Life needs water. Life evolved in water. And what's, what, what's this connection to water? Why is water so important? Um, we can quote all of these things here. The basis of this is understanding that water is a polar molecule that forms hydrogen bonds. You've got this, I don't want to, I actually quoted the Wikipedia. This came right out of the Wikipedia for my definition of hydrogen bonds. Yes, you can also use the Wikipedia for this class. It is Wikipedia, Crash Course, Khan Academy. Fantastic resources. Yes, the Wikipedia is accurate. You've been lied to. Or you've been talked to by people that are misinformed when it comes to science anyways. No, seriously, Wikipedia is very accurate. I donate to it every month. I donated last week. Yay. You know, it's like the largest repository of human knowledge in the history of humanity, and it's free, and they don't have advertisements, and they're not beholden to any government, corporation, or shareholders. Yeah, I love it. Now, now that I've given my spill for the Wikipedia and why it's the greatest invention of the web, 
It ain't social media except for maybe YouTube. Let's get back to this. The reason why water is so important for life is because it is a good solvent. And it is a good solvent because many salts or salts can dissolve in water. So you can have metal ions dissolve in water. You know, metal ions are really important for us, like sodium, potassium, chlorine, calcium, right? We need these things. But because of water's polar nature, you can also have hydrophilic molecules dissolve in water as well. Salts, I mean, sorry, sugars and some amino acids and some nucleic acids. And these things have regions that are hydrophilic that will interact with water. They have regions that are hydrophobic that move away from water. And these are very important. So for life, if life is an emergent property of a complex system of chemistry, you need a place for all of these chemical reactions to take place. And they occur inside of cells in water. If it was gas, it's too diffuse. You can't get life popping out of the air because it's just too diffuse. The molecules would never be around each other long enough. On the flip side, if you had a solid, like a rock, well, does anything move around in a rock very easily? No. So your chance of encounters for chemical reactions would also be too slow. So water is the Goldilocks zone, right? Water provides this medium where you can have chemical reactions taking place in it, you know, trillions of times every second inside of each one of your trillions of cells. There's some big numbers in the universe, aren't there? Okay, so what this picture is showing is sodium chloride being dissolved by water. So water is a good solvent. And I've already gone over these terms. That's towely. You know, we use towels to dry off. What are towels made of? Well, they were originally made of what? Anybody know? Cellulose, cotton. They're made out of cotton. Cotton is made out of cellulose. Cellulose is made out of glucose. Glucose, does it dissolve in water? Does sugar dissolve in water? Yep. You bet. Because it dissolves in water, because it can form hydrogen bonds with water. Your towels, made up of glucose that make up the cellulose, guess what? can form hydrogen bonds with water and help pull the water off of you. And that's why we use towels to dry off with. Yeah, and yeah, that's, like I said, Tally from South Park. Very funny, weird, weird character. Okay, once again, hydrogen bonding, very important for properties of water. Hydrogen bonding, the water molecules attract to each other, okay? So water has this property of being cohesive. Water sticks to each other, like a cohesive group. It also has a property of adhesion. It sticks to other things. That's why if I brought in a, a water gun and started escorting people, you'd get really mad at me, right? Because, well, water being adhesive will stick to your skin, stick to your hair, stick to your clothes, right? Because a lot of our clothes are made out of cotton. So the adhesive thing of it, well, it sticks to it. This is very important for things like plants. You see the trees out there. There's a, looks like a pinion pine right out there by the window. Water is being released right now, almost certainly through the through those leaves. And the water enters the roots, moves up through the tree and out the leaves. And you, you haven't had a plant and animal form and function, but do you think the plant spends much energy moving water? Almost none. It's a completely passive process because the water molecules can stick to the insides of these vascular tubes called the, the xylem. It's a part of a plant where the water flows from the roots up to the plant, into the stems and out the leaves. 
So xylem is the vascular part of the plant. And because water will stick to the xylem, and plant cell walls are made of, anybody know? Cellulose, which is made of sugar, dissolves in water. The water molecules will stick to the insides of the plant and they'll go up like a straw. Oh, keep pushing the wrong button here. How many have ever seen insects like and spiders walk across the water? Yeah, they can do that because of surface tension on the water. They spread out their body weight like this, and then they can actually walk across that surface tension. That's not a spider. That's a, a bug called a water strider. And you'll see them here around here during the summertime. But this is the property of cohesion right here. Water is also vital for life. We experience this today. When I got up and went outside, it was 18 degrees. Yeah, did I instantly freeze when I walked outside? No, I probably thought that I was going to, right? Now I'm hot. So I'm overdressed for lecturing. But one of the things about water is it has a high heat capacity. What this means is that water can absorb a lot of energy before it increases in temperature. It also means that it can release a lot of energy before it decreases in energy. On a cold day, you walk outside. If you're holding something metal, it gets cold really, really, really fast. And that's because it gives off its heat really fast and equilibriates with the air around it. You, on the other hand, are much slower to cool down. There's lots of reasons. One of them is you're, you're generating energy because you're endothermic. But the other reason why you hold on to your heat is because you're mostly water. You're 75% water, give or take. And that water is going to take a lot of it. It can give off a lot of energy before it starts to cool down. That creates thermal buffers. So you could be in the Florida Keys in July, whereas if you're in the central part of the state, it's like unbearably hot and humid. You know, 98 degrees, and it's funny listening to all the people complain about how hot Florida is. You know, and it's like, well, why did you move here? Sorry, there's too many people in my home state. They all move there and complain about the heat. But if you're in the Florida Keys, it's cooler because the water is absorbing the energy from the atmosphere, keeping it cooler. A great example of this is also San Francisco. Who's ever been to the Bay Area in the summertime? It's cold. It's so weird. I was in San Francisco in like Sacramento Valley. Bakersfield is like 100 degrees. You go to San Francisco and it's like, it's cold here. And that's because you've got this current of cold water coming down from Alaska right next to the Bay Area. It's absorbing all the heat. Now, you go to San Francisco in the wintertime, it's the same temperature in the summertime. You go to Sacramento and it's like, I don't know, 40 degrees, 30 degrees, the Bay Area, it's like 50 to 60. And that's because of the high heat capacity of water. It can, it can give off a lot of energy before it changes temperature, and it can absorb a lot of energy before it changes temperature as well. Okay, um, let's go ahead and stop here, and I will continue on with this on Thursday, and we'll finish up chapter two. I'm going to do about a chapter a week, so that should give you an example of where, an idea of where we're going to be.